So when you say we, was that for you part of that? I did. I did five of them. So I did uh, Russia, Asia, Australia, Africa, South America, and North America. Welcome back to another Axe Family video. Hope you're doing well. Hope you got a smile on your face because today's a beautiful, beautiful day. We are headed inside to the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum. It's right here on a busy street in downtown Salt Lake City. And we're gonna be looking at a bunch of really cool cars. So let's go on and head inside. All right, we are now inside of the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum, and I want to introduce you to one of my new friends. His name is Kurt. How you doing, guys? Thanks for coming. And uh, Kurt has been involved with the Expedition Overland uh, YouTube channel, and he's going to tell you a little bit about this museum, and we're going to take a look around. Right on, let's do it. This is the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum here in Salt Lake City, Utah. The uh, collection right now is just about 75 vehicles, but that number is kind of always changing and growing. We'll introduce you and kind of tell the Land Cruiser story as we go through. But the goal of the museum is to have one of every major model or trim level, not one of every model and trim level, because that would be too many. So we're not going to have, you know, every color of Land Cruiser there ever was, but basically every major trim level of every series. So that starts with the 20 series Land Cruiser, and we even have a predecessor to that here and goes all the way to the 200 series Land Cruiser. So we have pretty much one of everything. We're only missing a few. So you'll see a few blank spots and I'll mention those ones to you as we do our tour. So the museum started because a gentleman named Greg Miller, who was, he, was the, uh, he, he founded the museum and got it all rolling. He went to Japan as part of Expedition 7 to pick up the Expedition 7 vehicles. And while they were in Japan, they went and visited a few different Toyota museums, thinking they're gonna find this giant treasure chest of Land Cruisers in a Toyota museum, and it just doesn't exist. They had one or two at miscellaneous ones, so he said, we need to have a Land Cruiser museum that that's, appreciates these vehicles, and as a great learning experience, even if you're not a Toyota guy, you can come here and learn about Land Cruisers, and anyone can come into this room and appreciate it. But if you're restoring a Land Cruiser, you could come here and open the doors and crawl underneath the truck and see what we hope is the most premier specimen of any one Land Cruiser. We're not 100% there yet, but some of these are the best ones that exist undoubtedly. And in some cases, they're some of the only ones that exist. So we'll kind of go through there and share the collection with you and ask any questions. Yeah, do you have like a personal connection to the museum? I do, well, so I, I do tours and help Greg. I've, I've helped uh, acquire quite a few of them. Uh, driven quite a few of them here too. So like some of the, the E7 ones, I, I was part of E7. I did five of the E7 continents, Expedition 7. Uh, so yeah, have a, a little bit of uh, connection with quite a few, but yeah, just uh, I, I volunteer here because it's fun to show people and it's fun to be involved. Yeah, all right. Well, thanks for opening the doors and being willing to show us around. Happy to do it. So this is called a Toyota BJT model. And this actually predates the name Land Cruiser. So you won't even see the Land Cruiser emblem on it uh, because it, it wasn't called a Land Cruiser. It didn't get that name for until a few years later on. The name was kind of in the works, but this would have been just called a BJT. And obviously, if you look at it, you'll see a lot of characteristics from other vehicles of that time. It's got a little bit of a Dodge Power Wagon front end, like World War II era. And from the back, it's got a lot of a Willys Jeep uh, look to it or uh, you know, a military Jeep of the time. So no doubt Toyota was, was taking style cues and design cues from those vehicles at the time. And they used this as a prototype for the Land Cruiser. So there were very limited numbers of this vehicle ever made, like we're talking well under a thousand, somewhere in like the 300 range of these ever made. Wow. And maybe only a half dozen that are known to survive. And there were different variations of this one. So there would have been a pickup truck variation and a couple others, and maybe one day, if they can be found, we'll have those here in the museum. But the Land Cruiser story really kicks off right here, which is the FJ25. And so the FJ25 would have been the first Land Cruiser that had mass production, and, and also the first Land Cruiser that came to the United States. And this Land Cruiser right here is the first one that came to the United States. So this exact truck is the very first Toyota Land Cruiser that Toyota sold in the United States market. And as best as anyone can tell with documentation, it's, it seems to be the truck. Welcome. Welcome, yep. And it's a uh, beautiful truck. You can see a little bit of design characteristics between the two. They're not identical by any stretch, but you can kind of see how the story 
you know, progressed from Evolved, the BJT yeah. to the 25. And the 25 came in both a hard top and a soft top. So this one was a factory soft top model, and this is a hard top model. And a lot of people easily, still to this day, confuse these with the 40 series Land Cruiser, which is the one that most people know the best as a Land Cruiser. And there's a beautiful row of 40s over there we'll go visit. But a few things you can easily pick out on these. They don't have a bezel around the headlights, so that's factory. They don't have, you know, kind of the full uh, patented 40 look that, that you notice. Uh, they have rounded out doors on the soft top model here, so a little bit rounded, and rounded wheel wells. So just a few little things, and there's some carryover between the 40. Uh, you know, a lot of things are the same, a lot of shared parts, but quite a bit of different stuff too. Frames, axles, suspension, brakes. So they, with the 25, they also had a long wheelbase four-door variant, which is the 28 here. And this one is extremely rare. It's the only one I've ever seen. And this truck took about three years to acquire and it came from Venezuela. So this truck just barely arrived within the last couple of months. Uh, and other models are kind of shown here. So the 25 hard top, soft top, but also 28s, which are a longer wheelbase. So generally speaking, and I won't bore you to death with too many details, but the way the Land Cruiser works is the first letter is the engine type. So an F, J, they all have a J in them. If it's a Land Cruiser, it has a J. And at the, an FJ would be an F-powered vehicle. An F's could be an F, 2F, 3F, that's a gas motor. But if it's a diesel one, it could be a BJ or a HZJ. And that's gonna tell you what motor it has. So with the model code, you can learn a lot about a Toyota. And then the, the first number will be like a two in this case, means it's a 20 series. So FJ25 tells you that it's an F-powered motor, gas, J is a Land Cruiser, 20 is a 20, five ser 20 series Land Cruiser, and the five, generally speaking, is the wheelbase. So the longer that last number, the longer the vehicle. Hmm. And that'll really make sense when we get over to the 70 series, because they have a 70 through 79. And as that number gets bigger, the vehicle grows in length. So then the next one is the FJ45. So then you start with the 40 series, and this truck isn't particularly right in place, but it's just kind of cool. It fits the story of this little row here. And the 45 is a 40 series front end. So now you got the bezel, a little different frame and suspension, and this is a four door wagon. And you could also get a 45 in a truck, uh, two different truck variations, a short bed and a long bed. So a couple different options there. All the years of 40s. Oh my Lord. Is that pretty? <laughs> so not, it's not just years, this is major trim, but so every major change, but also some wheelbase ones. So both sides kind of goes up and then comes back. So it's 40s down to 43s, 44s and then comes back around to 45s, uh, 47. You see we're missing a couple because that's some that are in the works or need to be purchased. We'll just roll through the 40s um, starting. This is a really pretty uh, 60, this one is a 62. So it's a really early 40 and then a 67. You kind of start seeing things change. You go from the corrugated top that it shared with like the 20 series to a solid hard top on the sides. So the, the, as the story rolls through, they just get a little more comfortable and a little nicer amenities. So you go from bench seats to a little bit nicer bench seats with more cushioning, to bucket seats, to bucket seats with headrests, center consoles, nicer door handles, nicer windows, you know, full hand crank windows with actual door cards inside. Whereas these ones were just metal. You open up the door and it's just still a metal door. Uh, and, and collectability wise, they're all popular, but some, you know, a lot of people favor the later models just because they have the, they're a little nicer to drive. These are three on the column, so three on the tree. It's fun to drive, but four on the floor is a little easier to drive. Quite a few of these are, in fact, all of this row so far, those three are restored. Uh, these two have not been restored. In fact, uh, these, these four through here have not been. And a few of these you'll notice are right-hand drive, so they're Japanese market ones. So everything from here over is a 40 series. This is actually a 41, it's called a BJ41, so it's a diesel. So it's a B diesel, it's actually a 2B in this case. And then 41, so it's a, the same wheelbase as a 40, but it only gets that name because it has the diesel. And then you have a 42, and this is an Australian spec. Kind of cool thing about this one is the three wiper blades on the bottom, and that's factory. Kind of neat, only the LX trim model got that, so it's kind of a rare to see. Is this a stock model or is it beefcake? No, this one's been cleaned up a little bit. This came from Australia. It has a like an old man emu lift on it. It has, of course, bigger tires. It's got a little more stuff done to it. And then kind of a, a South American market BJ42. So these are a little bit pointers. And a few things you'll notice on the late model ones is you have the ability to have power steering. 
the ability to have disc brakes that started in 76, but not all countries got that. Uh, and then also factory AC, so this has got factory air conditioning. So this is a real neat one, it's an 84, so it's the very tail end of the 40 series production and has kind of all the neat stuff people want. One other thing changed in the later years is the bezel. So it went to a square bezel instead of the rounded out bezel. So when you look at a Land Cruiser, you can really narrow it down to two or three years just by looking at it from the front on a 40 series. Because you got turn signals change, hard tops change. So if you get really geeky with it, you can start uh, figuring out what they are. Yeah. So 42, then we go to 43. And 43 is just gonna be a longer wheelbase, which is a really cool uh, platform size because then it gives you more room. But we never got the, the only one we ever got in the US was the 40. So the ones, twos, threes, we never got. We did get 45s, which are the, the truck and the wagon. But these mid wheelbase ones, we never saw. And they are, I'd love to have one because it'd kind of be the perfect one to build up and have as a trail vehicle. It gives you a little longer wheelbase and more importantly, more room inside. 40s get kind of tight. So then we move to these two beautiful BJ44s. And these both have, these are zero restoration. They came from Japan, there's a Japanese market. And they have really low miles. So in fact, this, this brown one here, if you look inside, the visor still has the plastic on it. And the door card still has plastic. So these have less than 20,000 miles on them each. So really low miles and no restoration work. So just kind of really cool, two cool trucks, factory soft tops. Kind of neat. And then you get into the 45s, and the 45s came three ways, as I mentioned, a long bed truck, a short bed truck, and then the LV wagon up front. Now this guy in the middle, it's kind of a, it's a mutt, a beautiful mutt. This is a Bondurante body. And these were built in Brazil, and so they were domestically produced in Brazil, and that's why you could get a four-door. And if you look closely, while everything's similar, there are a lot of weird body lines that you won't find on the Land Cruiser. And they did that, they're just a little bit different, but they were built under license, so it does say Toyota on it, and a, and a full Bondurante wood. This one's actually built on a 45 chassis, so it's a, this is a, a Jonathan Ward from I, you know, TLC Icon in California. It's one of his creations. A really neat truck, so it's a V8 powered, all modern drivetrain. It's a cool setup. That is really cool. You like that one, Alex? You want? There's like this pickup here, there's no option to even fold the windshield down, it's all just kind of molded in there. So we're, you notice we're missing a couple vehicles here. It's a couple other 45s that the museum's gonna have because 145 that we don't have here that we never got in the US but will be coming is a Troopy, a 45 series Troopy. There's a Troopy over here I'll show you but it's not the... These are the tire uh, wheels that uh, went through the 90s. Huh? They did and those are not the right wheels for this truck. Oh, it okay. came over from Japan that way. And this is a 46. So again, this is a JDM market uh, model, 46. And you can see a lot of stuff on it that's particular to what you a lot of times see in Japanese models, such as the fender mount mirrors. You never see this in the United States, but, but even a lot of other markets. But in Japan, it was quite a popular offering. Toyota always had options. They were about having options for people. We've talked about short wheelbase, mid wheelbase, trucks, four-door wagons. But when the four-door wagon stopped in the 45 series, like the green one up front there, they had to have an option for people. So they always did. And even though the 40 series kept going, they canceled the wagon, so they had to come up with a new wagon. And we got the 50 series. Uh, and the, particularly the 55 and the 56 was the two ways those came. And they made these from 67 to 80. And these are often called the Iron Pig or the Piggy or you know, just 55s. And they're probably one of the either most loved or most hated Land Cruisers. A lot of people don't like them and think they look like, I don't know, international scouts or you hear them called a lot of names. And value-wise, for a lot of years, they didn't do well. The price was kind of, get them out of my backyard, was the price of a beat-up, rusty FJ55. But more recently, they've become a more sought after. 18,000 original miles. So this is like the most pristine FJ55 that anybody knows about, unrestored. So this has had no restoration work done. So it's a really special truck. And this came out of Canada. We went up there and found a collector that had a handful of beautiful Land Cruisers. And this was one of them that uh, Greg was able to work out to get here in the museum. So as far as anyone's ever seen or knows of, this is probably the most pristine sample of FJ55 that exists. And a lot of times people ask the value and the problem is since there's only one of them, right. it's hard to put a value on it. But I mean, at an auction, could go crazy and hit a quarter million dollars or you know, could sell I, it, over 100,000 anyway for a truck like this. Yeah. Maybe more. 
hard to say. And then it kind of has a, a twin brother over here that is a Tagalon ex expedition vehicle one. This is a company in Moab that still runs to this day. They still use a lot of land cruisers and they do mountain bike and river rafting tours in the Moab area. And the neat thing about this truck is not only is it like that picture, it's that truck. It's that exact vehicle that was used in their brochure. Oh, wow, that's cool. And Gex has an awesome patina to it. And if it could tell stories, it's probably been on a lot of amazing adventures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, you can see the the interior compared to the, you know these two right next to each other. Oh yeah. How much use this one has this gone one through? This one has been rugged. Yeah. This one's an Australian spec, so the reason the, the major trim difference it represents are the ambulance doors on the back. So most of them are going to be a tailgate with, believe it or not, a power window. Just kind of cool in the you know 70s to have a power up and down rear window. But this one's got ambulance doors. Toyota's a solution provider, so when they're done in 1980 with a wagon. They're still making the 40 series all these years. They're a utility vehicle, but their wagon, they've got to have a, an answer. So in 1980, the FJ60 comes out of the 60 series for specifically. In the US, we got that as an FJ60. So it's got that same 2F gas motor that the 40 has and a four speed. But that came in three variants, a 60, a 61, and a 62. And there's just little changes across the board. 61s we never had in the US. They're gonna be a, a turbo diesel model. And then there are uh, 62s, and we actually don't have the perfect FJ62, like a US model one here yet, so that's one on the list. This is an HJ60, a Canadian spec, or sorry, a Japanese spec HJ60. This one also came from the collector in Japan, but if you peek inside, it not only has super low miles, but when it was brand new, they put all those plastic seat coverings on it, so it's like never had anybody sitting in the upholstery. Is that wild? And the door cards all have plastic on them, so it has... 23,000 kilometers, so call that like 16,000 miles, and in plastic its whole life. So this is another one of those. You probably won't find one that low of miles ever again. <laughs> and these are HJs, so that means they have an H family motor. In these case, it's going to be a 2H and a 12HT, a diesel, a, tur a diesel and a turbo diesel. So we never got those in the U.S. either. We've made it through the 40s and 55s and the wagons. Well, the 40 ends in 1984, they're, they're done with the 40 series, but they need to have a heavy duty offering for those markets that require that, but not a wagon. And that's where the 70 series comes out. And so in 1985, they launched the 70. And the 70 series is still produced to this day. So 1985 to current, they make the 70 series and it comes in a wild amount of configurations, not only different motors, different lengths. So again, there's a 70 through 79 offered it's in light duty and which would be like a Prado and heavy duty chassis. So the Land Cruiser one would all be the heavy duty, soft tops, removable tops, trucks, and troopies. So we have all of those represented here. We're only missing one, uh, two. We need an LJ72, which is a shorter wheelbase Prado. And we need an HZJ or a 77 of some variant, which is a four door. But overall you can see how many 70s it takes to tell the 70s story. And we never got these in the US which is unfortunate because they are so cool. Um, but there's a lot of people importing them. Quite a few of these came from uh, Japan, were imported, in fact, nearly all of them, or South and Central America. There's a couple here from Australia we'll talk about too. So really cool though, uh, soft top, still can fold down the windshield, vinyl seats, I mean, just super utilitarian, all the way to like real plush models, chrome, turbo, nicer seats. Uh, they came in a lot of different packages. And as time goes on, they get refinement. We kind of skipped, we'll, we'll go down this side. Like this is a newer Prado, it gets a little curvier front end. They just look a little more modern. And that's a 91, so by, by no means new. But as that number gets bigger, so does the wheelbase. So 73 and 74, they're gonna be the same wheelbase, removable tops, but uh, non-turbo and turbo variations. So this could be a gas or diesel non-turbo. And the 74 has got a 13 VT in this case. Really cool motor and little turbo diesel. These are fun trucks to blaze around in. And yet it's got a removable fiberglass top, so kind of a neat package. And then pickup trucks. So this is 75, and you could get a 75 in a truck or a troopy. So much like the uh, 40 series, you could, you know, a lot of variations. And then you can do four doors. So these are 78s, which are, they're Prado, so they're the lighter duty chassis, but they're in a four door. And then you have kind of two of the gems of the museum, and that's these, these are brand new, well, 2015s, but seven and eight miles respectively, uh, GRJ, a 76, and a 79. 
So in the 30th anniversary, which was 2015 of the Land Cruiser, of the 70 series, started in 85, with the 30th anniversary, they reintroduced these trucks in Japan only. They were still making Land Cruisers and the 70 series in many markets, but they weren't doing it in Japan. So they re-released them. And these have a 4.0 gas motor. So just like the same motor a Forerunner FJ Cruiser Tacoma has of similar vintage, which is kind of cool. I'd prefer a diesel, but it's neat that they were offering this in a 4.0 gas motor. So these are brand new factory Toyota winches, electric winches. These have factory locking discs front and rear, mm. solid front axles. I mean, these are like the perfect trucks. Mm -hmm. We just don't get them here. <laughs> so a lot of people ask, well, how are they here then? This is a museum. It's officially recognized as a museum from the EPA and the federal government. So these trucks are here on museum import status. And there's quite a few in the museum that are that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the unfortunate part is they can never be driven on a public highway. So they mm -hmm. are here in the museum for us to appreciate and share and learn from, but you can't just hop in these and drive them around. So a lot of people ask like, hey, how do you guys have those? That's not fair, I want one. Mm -hmm. Well, start a museum and never drive it. That's the unfortunate <laughs> part. So you can, as you can imagine, it's quite an investment to have these here and not be able to drive them, but that's the purpose of the museum is to uh, appreciate and share uh, what, what the Land Cruiser is. So we finished with the 70 series. And again, they still make that one, 1985, and you can buy a brand new 70 series in Australia, Africa, Central and South America. A lot of markets still have them, never in the US. And really though, we need a kind of buzz. We're gonna skip over this guy just for a moment. This is a US spec 200 series, fantastic truck, but a little out of place on the story. The next bump is the 80 series. So 1989, early 90, the FJ62 or the 60 series is done and they have to have, again, that wagon. So you got your utility line and your wagon line and the 80 series comes out in 90. And it was a big shift for Toyota and a lot of Land Cruiser owners didn't love it because it went to the option of leather or nicer interiors as the 80 series rolled on. But the big change was coil suspension underneath. And everybody was so used to leaf springs that they thought this thing was the devil. And fast forward 30 years now, everybody loves the 80 series. It turned out that it's, you know, the truck to have. So the 80 goes from 1990 to 1997, January of 98. And then the 100 series comes out. But in between, you get the 90 series. So we never got the 90 series in the US. It's again a Prado. You'll see it badged even as Prado's on here, Land Cruiser Prado. And the 90 series came in two door and four door. And then there's also a few other Prado models, 120s and 150s. And those would literally be the exact equivalent of our forerunners. They kind of changed in the similar eras and had very similar drivetrains. Hmm. So these have like 3.4 liter gas motors. It's called the 5VZ. It's the same as a 96 to 04 Tacoma or 96 to 02 forerunner would have had. So very similar. You fire these up, they sound just like a US forerunner. Hmm. Suspension similar, bodies are different. I mean, that's where the big change is. Cool trucks. Yeah. Kind of like real funky JDM graphics. Again, you see the, the fender mount mirrors. We never saw stuff like that. Kind of the, the, the cool push bars. They're cool. They're not really practical for off-road stuff, but they look neat. <laughs> so in the US in 98, when the 80 series finishes up, we get the 100 series. And if you thought Land Cruiser guys were mad when you got coil springs, now you have IFS under the front end in the US. And people were like, flipping their lids, man, having meltdowns. And then as, as these things got out on the trail and tried and true, they're awesome platforms. They do have IFS, but it's really burly stuff. Uh, it's not a rock crawler, but the 80 kind of was a sway away from that anyway. It's a big bodied vehicle. So playing in real tight stuff, it definitely has an edge, but the 100 series in the US got a V8 and that V8 has big power increases over the 80 series and really just drivability comfort wise. So the 100 has quickly become a popular vehicle. Uh, still now guys are you know, still buying them up and building them. The motor, this is a 4.7 and Toyota had a Tundra. I don't remember what year it was that got a million miles on it. The Toyota actually ended up buying back from the customer. It was also the, the 4.7, the, the 2UZ. It's a fantastic motor. So it's not as powerful as the newer Land Cruisers have or even the newer 100 series, but it's a great motor. So hmm. two different hundreds. This is a, a personal one that's obviously quite built up. I think this is the one he took on our trip. Does that sound right, Alex? Remember that? Yes, sir. This would have been the one he had. So this is a, a really beautiful build, but they're also early and late model 200. So the dashes are a little different, a little different headlight configurations, and the motor got beefed up a little bit too. So these have around 235 horse, and these got 285, as I recall, right in that range. A little different motor configuration, and a four-speed turned into a five-speed. 
Mm. Kind of just cool usability things, nothing super crazy. And then outside the US though, they still stuck with that solid axle. And this is a, so it's a 105. And the 105 has a solid front end on it still. Didn't get the, uh, didn't get the IFS. And that came in different variations, diesels, and this is a gas model. So it's a gas model with the solid axle. So kind of a neat truck in Australia. And this is uh, Cruiser Dan, who is the curator here at the museum during the day, or you know, all the time, but he's here every day. Dan found this one in Australia. It's a really rare one because probably one of the only trucks in Australia that doesn't have a bull bar on it mm. and hadn't been heavily wheeled. It's just a really clean truck, cloth interior, which you don't see on late model ones here in the US on any hundred, uh, would be really rare. So kind of a cool truck. And then when the 100's done in 1998, you get the 200 series. That's where things get pretty dang awesome. That's what Alex and I drove down here today and he was sitting there commenting like, this thing is smooth. <laughs> they are nice trucks. They, in the US, we got a 5.7 liter. It's got 381 horse, so like massive power increase over the 100's and any previous Land Cruiser. And that's what the one down there on the end is. And they have a six or eight speed transmission depending on the year. And this particular truck is an Australian spec and this has a 1VD FTV. This is a 4.5 liter twin turbo diesel, factory Toyota. So these trucks are awesome. And power wise, it's real similar to the 3UR and speed wise. Done a little, little drag racing with them side by side, but fuel economy, this diesel rocks it. So it's, it's a, you know, performance spec wise, it's not the most amazing diesel, but they just work reliability wise, they're, they're pretty stalwart. So that's really the Land Cruiser story. This back row here is all mutts. Alex, that's the truck John was driving on the trip right there. Oh, I didn't want to look because I was getting distracted. Okay, for sure that was the truck he was driving. <laughs> no, you don't. So that's the truth because I see the fleet. We can talk. These are the Expedition 7 vehicles. If you're not familiar with them, that's the trucks that went on. It's called Expedition7.com, and it was a global journey. So this middle truck here, the one that's sideways, um, its, name is, it's, its name is Fernway, and that is the only vehicle, the only four-wheel vehicle that is driven on all seven continents and crossed six of them, in fact. So it drove on Antarctica, but it, it drove across six of the continents. So really a neat truck. And the other four are really best, best worded as kind of support vehicles for the Expedition 7 journey. This one here, it's named Mateship, and it went on six continents. It did everything but the Antarctica. It did not, did not go down to Antarctica. So these two trucks on the end are 79 series, a four-door and a two-door variation. So it's, a, it's really cool. This one was, a, this end one was built out of parts. It's actually on a 60 series chassis, but it's a 79 body. And that one started the trip, but it has a 18Z six cylinder diesel that has an aftermarket turbo. It's a great truck, but it couldn't keep up with these V8 turbo diesel trucks. So that one kind of got left behind and shipped home. And we built this one in Australia, this VDJ 79. So this has got that V8 turbo diesel. And that's a, one of the first four-door models that came to Australia. It's got locking disc front and rear, as do the rest of them. And then the two Troopies are 78s, and there's a 76 series on the end. So it kind of went in a flow. These two did it. This one did all seven. That one did six. This one did four. That one did two. And the one on the end got bought at the tail end of Africa and just did South America back to Salt Lake here. So they shipped, we shipped to Buenos Aires, drove it down to the bottom, Ushuaia, and drove them all the way back to Salt Lake here. So when you say we, was that, were you part of that? I did, I did five of them. So I did uh, Russia, Asia, Australia, Africa, South America, and North America. That's did awesome. not do, I didn't do the Europe segment, and I didn't do the Antarctica segment. They only took one truck. So this was my baby. Between the two trucks is what I spent the most time in. Big rolling story, and it's awesome. There's a cool video online, so go check it out, expedition7.com. This is the Mutt Row here. Uh, these, as you can see, some of them are Land Cruisers, some of them are kind of Land Cruisers. This is a Q series truck. This is actually a predecessor to any Toyota trucks that we ever had in the US. So kind of a, be the uncle of a Land Cruiser, if you will. This one here is called a Delta Mini Cruiser. Two different things, uh, Wildcats and a couple other names depending on the markets they're in. And I don't know when they stop because as it's not a true Land Cruiser, I haven't personally invested a ton of time learning a lot about them, but this is kind of a cool model here. It's called a PX10. And these were built in really low numbers by Toyota, or at least Toyota's body company. And these were built as kind of a soft sell to see what a modern looking Land Cruiser would look like on an older drivetrain. So this is a 97. Also part of the story is the FJ Cruiser. 
It's not a Land Cruiser. A lot of people debate that whether it is or not. It's a great vehicle. It stands on its own as a, a perfect vehicle. It brought a lot of people to the Toyota Marquee. Guys have taken these and done all sorts of awesome, extreme, and amazing trips with them. Built them into desert racers, built them into rock crawlers. Uh, they're a very cool vehicle. Um, a little different lineup. They do share a lot of parts with a Prado, so outside the U.S. <laughs> so this one is a, a 45 custom truck. This is actually was a short wheelbase pickup truck that was turned into a troop carrier. And we call this one Frankenstein. I don't know where exactly it got that name, but it's appropriate because this truck has everything. So this has got a, a, a diesel put in it. It's got kind of, it's a total mutt, 60 series axles, probably 80 series parts, but it's the best of, of a true like utilitarian truck. This has a FLIR camera, so it's got basically, you know, night vision, if you will, on a fold down camera, both remote control that and a remote control spotlight. It's got like more lights and switches and instruments and converters, inverters. This thing is like a total uh, apocalypse vehicle. And a really neat truck, it works, it just works real well too. This is just a rare one, this is a 74. And then you've got a, this just got some cool race province. It's an Australian uh, BJ73 non-turbo, but that one ran in the Outback Challenge. Uh, Greg and Jeremiah went over there and raced that one in the Outback Challenge. Really typical Australian build. Lights, lights higher in the bumper, the antennas, just, it's a neat truck. And then these two, and I guess probably a couple others, and more to come. Land cruisers across the globe are used for everything. I've seen them as hearse, I've seen tow trucks. You have a fire truck here, this is a, a 56 fire truck. This is a radio, like a antenna repair vehicle for a television station. So if you go look at the back, there's a full workstation with com like computers and testing equipment back there. Uh, but yeah, they police vehicles, ambulances, I think I said tow trucks, but around the world you'll find them as everything, which is kind of cool that they are such a utilitarian and such a diverse platform. So we hope to get some more working ones here in the museum, but uh, these are just two cool ones that kind of show off the things they can be. Some of these are personal vehicles that go out and still do trips. Others are museum ones that don't really fit in the lineup because they're built or they're not stock. But two really neat ones that are unique to the museum here are the mega cruisers again they're not land cruisers they don't say land cruiser anywhere on there they are mega cruisers so they're much bigger than a land cruiser and the mega cruiser comes in two variations a bxd 10 which is a military version and a bxd 20. the bxd 10 was used by military forces most predominantly the, the japanese defense force is a their japanese vehicle you'll notice it has a lot of similarities to like a u.s humvee and that's by no mistake, they were NATO designs. They wanted to fit the same design requirements, the same lengths, a lot of the same look. Japan at that time and to this day is an ally of the United States, so we were doing a lot of cooperation on our militaries. So it's no doubt that that vehicle has a very Humvee looking design to it. Uh, a couple neat things about the, the Mega Cruiser, like a Humvee, it has four wheel independent suspension, so real high ground clearance. But one thing the Mega Cruiser has that the Humvee didn't is four wheel steering, so the back Axle the back tires actually turn as well and provide a lot tighter turning radius so it does turn a little tighter. <laughs> They're not built to the same spec uh, service wise and weight wise as a Humvee. These have a four cylinder diesel in them. It's a great diesel and it, it moves these around just fine. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a kind of a, a, yeah, a larger displacement four cylinder diesel, but they, like a military one, you would never see them like fully up armored, at least I haven't as like a Humvee would. You wouldn't put you know, 10,000 pounds of armor on one of these. They just weren't designed for that. They're more a light mobility vehicle. And then they built a really small number, less than, I want to say the number is 281 comes to mind, under 300 of the civilian versions, uh, civilian mega cruiser. So if you look in there, that's very, the same drivetrain as this military one, but with a civilian body wrapped around it. So totally different sheet metal, the full top. And they were available in low tops, which this one is, or a high roof, um, just like some of the 80s and 60s could come that way. Uh, this was the same, it's same like variant. It's a small tour bus, you know? It is. It has that tour bus feel. The crazy thing is to sit in the two seats in and you middle. can barely fist bump across the middle. I mean, they are that wide. I mean, they're neat, but they're big. Well, so that's actually a 40 series four-door body on a Mega Cruiser chassis. So that's one of these same drive trains oh. with a four-door body. So you notice the four-wheel independent suspension, the four-wheel steering. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this is a Mega Cruiser drive train and body frame, or, you know, frame and chassis and drivetrain with a 40 series custom aqualu four-door aluminum body they don't have a whole lot of land cruiser dna that's why they're so they're hidden over here well i'm gonna have to test drive a few to decide which one right, i want should, should pop the door open <laughs> they all run most yeah. of them anyway well thanks for joining us here at the land cruiser heritage museum you can learn more about it at landcruiser 
landcruiserhm.com. So Land Cruiser HM is in Heritage Museum, and you can learn more about the Expedition 7 trip at expedition7.com. Uh, if you go down in the description down below, there's a link for you guys. You can check it out. Uh, thank you so much for showing yeah. us around. Glad to be Super here. Super good to meet you. Glad you could come. Um, you have a wealth of knowledge about all these cars, so you're probably the perfect person today to, to lead us through it. So. Well, thanks for coming. I hope you guys enjoyed. I know it was a lot of information to promise there, or to, to process. There will be a, a quiz. Yeah. So before we get out of here, we're going to do a quiz. Okay. So if you're new to my channel, my wife and I and our dog, we're traveling full time right now in our Toyota Tacoma. And so you can go check out some of our other videos. Push that subscribe button all the way in. There's a big thumb war going on on YouTube right now. So click the thumb war button and we'll see you later. Hats off to you.